Welcome to Out of the Blank. Welcome to another episode of Out of the Blank Podcast. Rich, it's a pleasure to have you back on the show. It's been a it's been a been a hot minute. I think it's since panel episode two that we did, which was a couple months back. Um, how have you been? You look great. You got the hair growing. You look like Fabio, man. I love it. Going going for a Chris Helmsworth, I guess. Uh, Chris, you know, how dare you call yourself Thor? You do not have the Swedish genetics to be able to pull that I'm off. I'm not a I was never a you know, I'm a DC guy, first of all. Okay. And so Thor, Thor is a god. Thor is a is a Roman god. So, uh, yeah, the superheroes that we have now are based on all that, but they brought in Thor directly from the Roman. I've been diving down that whole origin of comic myth and all that type of stuff. It's I have those saved in my watch list, but then I have six hundred things on my watch later list. So that's the way my any dirty movies on there. Uh, no. <laughs> I've been looking – all my YouTube search has been Kennedy-related stuff for, like, the past couple of months. I feel like it's – I don't know. Like, I just – ever since talking about it the first time and then kind of diving into it more and then all my conversations with all the researchers, yourself included, um, Joe Green, I just started learning so much stuff that I didn't think was real. And it was like, where's – I mean, I'm down the road right now where I've honestly been focusing more on the intelligence agencies. Um, there's a big disconnect between the public connection with what the intelligence agencies are doing to the point where when me and you say something about a heart attack gun, people would say that's a conspiracy. And I think that's a little bit ridiculous because it's real and I, we have video proof of that. Yeah, uh, I did. I Just today, I caught up on the, your last uh, discussion with uh, Joe Green and David Benton. Well done. Good job. Um, and um, you got into some of the intelligence stuff there. They had some great things to say. And, you know, it, the CIA is is based on, especially the covert action part, which is what they've become mostly. And however many, several dozen covert op operating agencies that we know, both know and don't know about, but we use this, the umbrella term CIA. Um, and their covert covert actions are conspiracies. They do illegal stuff and they do it in secret and they plan it together. So C CIA, uh, conspiracy intelligence agency. So well, there's a difference between like, I mean, I think if you opened up the door now and said that people were wiretapping people or mail surveilling i mean our phones are electronic devices that they can spy on anytime they want that's just now it's become so normalized people couldn't care about their digital rights or anything of that sort that discussion's kind of lost but then it goes what about even farther and it's something i put a little bit more weight into than i probably wouldn't have before and i've talked about it a couple of times but in 1971 hail boggs happened to call out J. Edgar Hoover and said that he was spying on congressmen with his FBI. It's a video you can watch on YouTube. Um, and the guy says to him, what's your proof on that? And he says, it'll come out. Um, and he goes, why hasn't it come out already? And he says, you're basically asking the FBI to investigate the FBI. Now him saying that, and then his plane goes missing, I put a little bit more weight into that. But when I look at the church committee report, it was a whitewash. I was reading it and they exposed some things. I think they did a lot, but there's this idea that's out there that the government is incompetent. The government, look how many mess ups they have. I go, incompetence is not being caught. Incompetence is the, or I mean, it, they never, nobody ever pays a price. None of the central intelligence agencies have reduced budgets. None of the FBI has reduced budgets. They get a crappy article about them, like William Colby exposing the CIA. Yeah, that they'll never recover from this. And look what happened to William Colby. But did the CIA change? Yeah, yeah. Incompetence, that the word incompetence, big red flag whenever you hear that. If they try to, you know, CIA gets caught in something. 
uh, or they, they, they claim, oh, intelligence failure, 9-11 intelligence failure. No, no. Uh, it's just a, uh, they're lying. It's propaganda. They try to like divert your attention. It's a, it's a magic trick. They try to divert your attention over the incompetence. They're not incompetent. Like I said, their budgets keep going up. Uh, <laughs> if they were incompetent, somebody would cut their budgets, you know. So, well, it's the dangers of that propaganda word because it makes people start thinking that they're insane. I mean, I heard recently, um, yeah. gaslighting. If, yeah. Well, they are professional gaslighters. If you read Richard Helm's biography, I think this is pretty interesting. But in his rough draft, when he was spewing out his thoughts, there was um, so it was just fresh from his brain. There's a thing in there where he said during his time as director, he had participated in a thousand covert operations. Now read the final draft and the final draft by a ghostwriter who's done a lot of ghostwriting under this name for plenty of CIA directors, Alan Dulles included, changed it to a couple dozen. The impact of those words going from a thousand from a rough draft spew flow of information of thought on a piece of paper to the final revised copied version, which is a couple dozen. I mean, that impacts the history books when that starts going out there. And I think there's like a, a lot of things that have been exposed that are important that the public's disconnected on but there's also a lot of things that might have been manipulated and changed and that can lead you down a really dangerous route and if we talk about the kennedy assassination obviously there's a lot of things i probably don't agree with and i feel like you don't need the discussion for the public to get interested on it's a pruder film alteration i know you, you you like to talk about that one too but that's one where it's like to get the public in on the discussion, just point out the obvious flaws. Oswald's job at the book depository building, he got it there a month before, had five days to prepare when they published the route, chose a small-ass window, and then ditched a rifle that was going to lead right back to him. And then you went to a theater. These are all things that are just giant red flags. Oh, yeah. 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 It's a conspiracy. Um, it's a damn good one. All the all the documents have been released. And guess what they say? Conspiracy. Uh, you know what's in the documents that are still not released? Conspiracy. I don't. I'm not holding my breath anymore for more documents. I stopped doing that a long time ago. But um, on the Zapruder film, though, uh, I've. It's not a New Year's resolution, but the timing. You know, I discovered Substack. Uh, some people that I know uh, were using it already, uh, Russ Baker, Bill Nelson. Um, but I wasn't paying much attention to what it was, but it's a great little venue for putting your writing up there. So I got myself a Substack uh, account. So bartholoviews.substack.com. And I've already got like a dozen things up there in the last month. Um, so, uh, and one of them is my, I've only done one Zapruder film uh, article. It's very short. It's in my book, but uh, my, my goal is to get all this stuff that's scattered around the internet and it's in my book, which you have to buy unless I give you a copy. Uh, it's all behind paywall. It's either behind a paywall or it's obs some obscure place that you have to like really dig. Nobody's gonna dig. So I decided I'm gonna put all my favorite stuff in this one place that I can just send people links to. I promote it on my uh, Twitter and the CDPR Facebook and wherever else. And so just go to bartholomews.substack.com and you'll see what I've put up. Read that Zapruder film article. It's called Z Film Red Frame White Light. That's a reference to the orchestral maneuvers in the dark song, Red Frame White Light, which I opened with a quote from. Um, and uh, it's about one frame of the Zapruder film, frame 227. If you want to prove the Zapruder film is fake, all you got to do, if you prove one frame is fake, the whole f uh, film is fake. So I concentrate on 227 and I, I prove it's fake. Oh, and I'm enhancing, you read the, you read the stuff in, in my book, it's nothing but text, right? We couldn't even put pictures in there, just a, a couple of pictures. But um, here I'm putting pictures, I'm linking to videos and all kinds of stuff. So there's several videos on YouTube that I've linked to that 
um, show the people saying the things that I quoted them saying. So I'm enhancing it and it uh, should be a little bit more accessible and uh, better to read and understand. Um, and I've put a lot of my most recent stuff, including my most recent one on there is um, I retitled a thing I had done for an obscure journal that nobody reads. And I, I kind of rewrote it, I added to it. So it's basically new. It was based on a couple of short little opinion pieces in that journal. Um, and I gave it a new title just to kind of renew it. And it's called A Few Bad Men. And it's subtitled More Thoughts on Resolving the Kennedy Assassination. So, and it's short too, it's like a five minute read. So, and it also, I have two footnotes in it that refer back to two other essays, The Gordian Knot and The Real Conspiracy Nuts. And you read those three, <laughs> Real Conspiracy Nuts, Gordian Knot, and A Few Bad Men. You'll see where my thinking is right now and uh, how frustrating it is to listen to. Like even Joe and, and David, uh, <laughs> who I love, you know, they're my buddies who are CDPR together. But, uh, and Joe published my book, so. Um, and of course, David and his buddy, Ed Tatro, also my buddy, they invite me to his conferences and stuff, and I appreciate them doing this. They're fabulous, I love them, I love those guys. And you had us all on a panel once too. Um, but when I hear them <laughs> going back over, for me, you have to realize, for me, this is all rehashing. I'm, I'm at 33 years now, 33 years of digging into this stuff in, in the kind of detail. How long have you been doing this? Eight months now? Eight or nine months? Of what? The Kennedy assassination? Yeah. September. September of last year? Yeah, that's Jefferson Morley. No, no. You, you and I started our podcast in, back in June. Has it been that long already? July fourth was my was when you published the first oh, one. Let me so, check one. So maybe check. September, September twenty twenty one is when you got it. I hope not. If it's already been a year, I got to stop the Kennedy assassination research because my life has just gone so fast. Then, uh, you you can't once you get as deep deep into it as you are now. Oh my God! It was nine months ago. Yeah, I was thinking eight or nine months is when you got into this. So you're not even a year into it yet. Jesus. I'm done after the, the thing comes out. So I mean, it took me a year to read 10 books. My first year of digging every day, reading every day. It took me a year to get to 10. Uh, I pretty much stopped reading after about 100 books, plus at least that many journals. I still read uh, Kennedy's and King, a few other things uh, that come up, but not intensely daily. I did that for 10 years. And I was writing too. I was writing in the fourth decade and the third decade. And um, and Assassinated Chronicles, Daily Plaza UK, all these things were print, print issued back in those days. Uh, we were just getting started with uh, the internet and chat back in the mid 90s. Uh, and so I jumped into that. And um, so, but my point is 33 years. Can, can you even imagine? You're nine months into this. You've been, you've, you've learned a lot. In fact, you have stuff in your head now that I forgot about long, years ago, a decade ago or more. But you evolve into different phases. You're, you're thinking, you know, what are, and Dave and Joe in that podcast you did with, uh, with them. They at the end of it, they started getting into where I'm totally at now, and that was, you know, they go they rehash all of this, and for them they're rehashing too because they know this stuff so thoroughly. David teaches it for God's sake. He he goes in front of a class every day of people who know nothing about this, and he goes from the beginning. And I've done that, by the way. I've done it with high school kids, and with college kids in a couple of um, temporary situations. And man, your brain is so intensely into it. And that's where Dave is. He rehashes it every day. But 30, think 33 years. I'm at 33 years now. 
Well, what what area are you in right now that we like some things that David and Joe said that you just didn't maybe agree? Oh, when with. they were saying when they were saying, um, so what do we do now? But then they get away from it. They'll they'll say, yeah, okay, we 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 talk about that. We talk about this. We talk about that. Uh, yeah, we we know all this. We know it's a conspiracy. Uh, what do we? What do we? What's next? What do we? What do we do with all this? But then they. They just sort of like, and then go into something else, and they dig into some other rehashing. Um, well, what can you? But do? I, since ever since I um, helped form the uh, Center for Deep Political Politics (CDPR), that came out of my thinking to um, to just find a real. It's called real politic. Uh, a practical, realistic way to use the information we got, which all says conspiracy. We have proven the conspiracy. We know what the truth is. And and everybody that goes onto venues like this, or their books and their their journals and their articles and their films and their mock trials and uh, their debates, their mock debates. They're like, once again, after 60 years, they're trying to convince the people, the, the, the Posners, the Gerald Posners. They're trying to convince. I heard David say that in that episode that I just listened to today. Uh, he, he says, uh, he was making some kind of point and he said. Uh, the Posners of the world. Yeah. The Posner's of the world. He says, well, Joe Posner says the opposite, and then blah, blah, blah. And, uh, you know, this is what I'd say to Joe. Don't say anything to Joe Posner. I don't care. It's flat earth. It's flat earth thinking, and it's gaslighting. Uh, they're, they're trying to gaslight you into saying that the earth is flat. Don't even bother with it. Mark Twain said, don't argue with a fool. The, the onlookers can't tell the difference. Well, uh, through, so through, don't argue with, well, through my well, alleged not, nine months into this assassination thing, I've started to notice the real conspiracy people. I mean, recently, I think even in that episode with David and Joe, I mentioned about the person who said that it wasn't Jack Ruby who shot Lee Harvey Oswald. I had one guest out of all the JFK assassination researchers that started blaming it on like the Jewish people of the world. And it's a lot of stuff where you start going, this is where the real conspiracy stuff starts really flooding the market and you get into a really dark territory. I'm just trying to stand by what I can show through documentation and even some of the stuff where people say you can't really see Jack Ruby's face. There's a lot of stuff in that whole thing that is very suspicious to me. I mean, I wouldn't say that it was exactly staged, but I mean, less than I think in the same footage clip you can watch on YouTube after he kills um, Lee Harvey Oswald, it's less than like five minutes later after the guy's talking, you see Jack Ruby in white clothes walking down the hallway where I don't believe that it wasn't Jack Ruby that shot Oswald, but I see where their point are that comes in that. And I mean, it's the same thing with like the Zapruder film. Like, what do we choose and pick as the stuff that we can say is a conspiracy or say that's altered and stuff like that without going really, really in detail into things. And you just can't do that in a rough hour or two hour show on it. And it's like, I, that's where the public gets lost. And I try and stick with the things that we can prove is like, there's a lot of things that don't make sense. Even my own digging through Oswald's autopsy report. Cause I thought I have a document that states he got shot in the line of duty. And I was like, okay, well, his autopsy report should show some scarring from a couple of years ago. That should be written down. It's not in his autopsy report. They mentioned the cuts on his wrists, but they don't mention the gunshot wounds. So then I had to Google when was the cutoff to get medically discharged from whatever. And he passed right under that. So maybe the guys just sent him home with something small that really didn't leave a mark. Sure. And they just wrote it down as a gunshot wound. That's good research, I think, a good kind of track. But then there's like so much fringe stuff where it's like, where did you hear that? Well, it comes from this one testimony. And it's like, well, you can't bet the whole farm on a testimony. Well, you know, you even – that goes back to uh, Bill Cooper, the uh, the guy who wrote uh, the book. I can't remember the name of it. Pale Horse something, Bill Cooper. He was uh, 
a guy who first started doing the disinformation stuff. He was a moon landing hoax guy. He uh, He's the guy who came up with Bill Greer, the Secret Service agent, driving the limo, turned around and shot Kennedy based on seeing a fuzzy Zapruder film and the, the light reflection. That's not even the craziest. Dan Rather on television showed how the Zapruder film could, um, the frames, how it wasn't altered. And the guy standing there, he goes, what about this? Where the head obviously goes back, goes to the untrained eye, it looks like it goes back. But honestly, this could be Jackie Kennedy that just pushed JFK back a little bit. And I go, that's on television. They broadcasted that on television. That man said that. And I said, holy shit. You know, and like I've been saying over and over, I said it in the, in the Gordian Knot article, plausibility is not required. All that in big... When you tell a big lie, just go back to the definition of the big lie, you know, in Mein Kampf, uh, Hitler, uh, Goebbels, the big lie, uh, just make it so big and outrageous that nobody would dare question it. You know, if people tell little lies all day long, and so you tell a big enough lie, uh, it's like it blows you away, and it's like, oh, well, that's got to be true because, you know, I know what a lie is. and that's you know that's too big to not too big to fail is what it is, and that's the the basis of the big lie, uh, and stuff like like that. Uh, it's a big lie. Um, now Bill Cooper may have convinced himself. I don't know. Or, or I tend to. You're better off gravitating towards not incompetence, but on purpose. Uh, in most cases, it's on purpose. Um, and so all this stuff creeps in to distract you. And, and you don't you don't really you don't need <laughs> when and once you get into the real details of stuff, that's where they try to throw in detailed stuff that's like wrong. You see it, you see it thoroughly in the moon hoax stuff. I'm gonna um one of the articles I'm gonna put up on Substack soon is the one I did uh that's only in print now, but it's called the Moon Hoax. The, the moon landing hoax hoax and the moon landing hoax was invented to uh, trap people <laughs> into uh, ignoring the fact that there's a secret space program that's what that article is about it's about the secret space program which does exist and I prove it in that article I show you the proof of it uh, it's it's not hidden uh, but it's so, something they don't talk about. Uh, there was even a PBS Nova about the spy astronauts they sent up in the 60s. When, all, when we were seeing the, the main astronauts going up, they were sending spies up there in secret missions to test out like surveillance cameras and stuff. Uh, Russia was doing it, we were doing it. And right there, at the beginning, that's a secret space program. You think they stopped after that? No. I don't think they ever went up there. From, from the beginning, yeah. Well, so, okay. So there's there's a group of people, and even Joe Green toys with this idea. Uh, I can't wait till the next time I sit down at dinner with Joe. We were we're gonna try to do that. But, Me and him have talked about it, but he never wanted to I do mean, it he on doesn't, air. He doesn't get all serious in, in, into it, but some people do. But Joe will like toy with the idea that uh, you know the. Uh, Van Allen radiation and all this. Uh, nobody's going into deep space. You can't go into deep space. They didn't go to the moon. Uh, nobody's even been beyond the, the point of Earth orbit. He plays around with that idea just to irritate me, I think. But um, um, if if you buy in, if you if you take that, and I saw Phil Phil Nelson recently bought into all the moon hoax stuff, and then. Some people took him aside. Some of his buddies took him aside. I know this because he wrote a follow-up piece where he said, sorry, sorry, everyone, I, I made a mistake. So my, my buddies explained it to me that the moon hoax isn't a real thing. And, and he had to apologize for it because he went full in on this one article he wrote. Uh, but that's what they do. They try to suck you into these fake conspiracies so that they can discredit you. It's a it's called a straw man argument. And you and the moon hoax hoax is a straw man argument because look at who it destroys first. 
the people who are trying to say uh, we don't go into space, uh, look, they fake the moon landing because we don't go into space. Well, then what about the secret space program? See, they are distracting you from the secret space program. You cannot have a secret space program if we're not going in space. See how that works? So, and that's it's what careful. my it's, article. It's really careful to not lump all these in with the JFK stuff or anybody who's new to it all is going to think we're nuts. It's like when me and Larry were talking with Campbell and we were supposed to talk about aliens and then we ended up diving down the JFK thing for an hour and a half, basically. And then, oh, God. Yeah, I did that for a long time. I uh, I avoided talking about my I have I've had two close encounters of the first kind that we've never talked about that. We have never talked about that. Let's do it. And I'm I, I'm willing to talk about it because I don't believe you. Um, I'm I've kidding. never done it. I've never done it on audio or video uh i did do it i did in that article uh the moon landing hoax hoax which i'm going to put up digital on substack so that it's easy to find and out from behind the paywall uh you'll see that i i um came out in that article that's that was my coming out as a, a ufo experiencer but i still didn't tell the story uh it was like a few months later it was on uh, Leap Day, last leap year, February 29th, uh, a couple years ago, that I went on Twitter and I I wrote the full stories that I'd been telling. In per- I said, I'll tell anybody this in person. I even told Lisa Pease this because I saw her at a conference in Olney. It was the one I last saw her. And we, we started talking about, about I mentioned that I, I've seen UFOs. She ha- I think she has too. But, uh, when you're in Kennedy assassination research for, for decades, you just you, you stay away from it. Jim Mars, though, he went full in. He did a whole book. He did the crossfire of UFOs, the old alien agenda. Tell me your experience. Um, well, like I said, you'll find it, you can find it on, on Twitter. Just now, you know, search, I want to hear it. I want to hear yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, because for years I just told totally it Okay, here, here's what happened. You, you said you had two. I, I've had two. I want to hear one. I want to hear the first one, and then we can get to the second. Let one. me tell you why I'm willing to talk about it now. Why I put it on Twitter? I put it on Facebook because after the uh, the TikTok incidents, and the government admits that that the uh, the data on that was real, the video was real. They they admitted UFOs were real. They that's they renamed it UAP so that you know they don't get the stigma of the old terminology. This is why I'm I'm willing to talk about it because the now, and then when people when people say um, um, they they complain about JFK assassination conspiracy, I'm not a conspiracy theory theorist. I'm not going to talk about conspiracy. Uh, I don't believe in conspiracy. I I say the simple phrase. That's what they used to say about UFOs. Yeah, and they discredited the people on the Robertson panel to the point where those people lost all credibility, and so I think some of them actually killed themselves. Oh, yeah, there was one guy, a guy named McDonald, who, unfortunately, it was tragic. The story, His story is tragic. He was a respected atmospheric scientist, and that's, those are the guys you want looking into it. You don't want astronomers. That's, a, that's a, a red flag with the new UAP panel that the Pentagon's put together. They're all like... There's some CIA people and there's uh, astronomers. Astronomers look at deep space. They're not concerned. And UFOs are in our atmosphere. You know, we're not finding UFOs in deep space, not yet. We might find a Dyson sphere at some point. We thought we thought a couple of things might be, and they still might be. But anyway, that's why I'm willing to talk about this now. So let me tell you my story. First one, January, I think I, I nailed it. I had, I had to look at, I remember what the weather was doing. I remember it was a, a dark night. It was cold in January in Garland, Texas. Uh, I graduated from Garland High School in 74. I went into junior college in the fall of 74. And by January 10th, I think it was January 10th, I settled up. Because all the, the weather and the wind and uh, the fact that the moon was not out, uh, there was no moon that I could see. Turns out it was like thin and way over setting uh, in the west. 
which was behind a big building from my perspective. So I didn't see the moon. Anyway, I, I looked at all this astronomical and astronomical and weather data, and I nailed it on June 10th. It also had to be a weekend because um, uh, my dad passed away in 1970. So it was just my brothers and my mom and me. We're living in an apartment in Garland, Texas at 1901 West Kingsley Road. There's a big old park behind the apartment complex, and there's a green belt that comes off of the park and goes north and south. And the park is elongated north and south. Um, and there's a, a corner store just walking distance, just like a couple blocks uh, to the north and, uh, and east. And I found myself at home alone because my, both my brothers and my mom were all out on dates. And that's how I knew it was a weekend. And so I'm at home and I'm on my own for dinner. I, I figure I'm going to go get myself a barbecue sausage sandwich up at the convenience store. It's one of my favorite things. So I put on my high school letter jacket and because it's cold outside. And I, I go out and I'm walking along that green belt, that north south green belt. And there's utility poles, there's power lines, there's a subdivision on the other side, houses, there's a ditch ditch where we would go catch crawdads and stuff when I was younger. And so I'm walking up to the convenience store. And so I have to make this long walk up this drive. There's a driveway and then the green belt and utility poles and the green belt. And so you're walking along and it's night and I'm always looking at, because I'm interested in astronomy anyway. And um, I'm looking to see, you know, the stars I can recognize and stuff. And you know how you get this feeling that you know, you either see it sort of peripherally or something. You just sense, uh, wait, some, something's following me. Um, and so whatever it was, I turned around and I looked over my uh, left shoulder. And I'm looking at the sky and stuff. And I see something dark against the sky, black, silent. And it, very quickly, I noticed that it is moving. It's moving in my direction. And it looked to me like it wasn't very high up because, like I said, there were these telephone poles, which are 40 feet high, usually, typically, this type of pole and, ut and utility lines. And so I stopped. You know, I see something. And it's continuing. It's moving from north to south at about four or five miles an hour, four miles an hour, walking speed, about the speed I was walking. So I stopped and I, and I, watch it and all of a sudden it's like well this isn't like anything that i've ever seen um it's not a balloon was it circular shape or was it triangle shape okay it was it was um uh delta wing shaped but not sharp delta wing um i want to build a model of it uh, i'm trying to find the right things to build it with but i did i did that night i'll get to that later let me just say that I recorded what it looked like uh, contemporaneously. I didn't have a camera or anything. And I, the only time I took my eyes off of it was to look around to see if anybody was looking out the windows, if anybody was driving by, if there was any other people out. No, no witnesses that I could determine. But I didn't want to take my eyes off of it for very long. So uh, it was delta wing shape. Um, I'll go ahead and tell you the description of it. Then I'll tell you how I determined size and shape and detail uh, later in the story. But it was about six feet wide by about three feet deep, delta wing shape, but rounded, a rounded delta wing, bulbous, made up of Michelin man type ridges. Like if you took a bunch of long black balloons, you blew up some long party balloons that were long, and different lengths to where you could put them together and make a delta wing shape out of it. That's what it was. And only about like four, four ridges on one side, four ridges on the other side, and one in the middle. So these big Michelin man type ridges that were different lengths that created a delta wing. And uh, perfectly matte black, it's matte black. There's no shiny parts to it. There are no lights on it. There's no sound. And it's going at five miles an hour, four miles an hour, just above the power lines. I was able to determine that. 
I was able to see the detail of the ridges of it. And so it's continuing on. It's going to the, there's a street. Kingsley Road is the street at the end of the driveway. And we're talking like another, you know, 50 feet, something like that. Uh, I saw, I give you, I give the distances in my, in my, in my written description, but uh, there's a, there's a street light. Here's the thing. I'm watching it because I know there's a street light at the end. If it continues in the path it's going, I'm going to be able to see some detail, hopefully, and, and judge its distance. Because if you see something in the sky, you have no way of determining distance. Um, it could be far away and huge, or it could be close up and small. So I'm waiting for it to go over the, the street light, which it does. And then some, some ambient lights reflecting off of it. And I can see the ridges. I can see it was matte black. Um, I can see that it was right above the power lines. So it's like 41, two feet up, just above the power lines. And it's following the power lines. So it, it, it never slows down or stops. It keeps going. And at this point, I'm walking behind it. I'm following it. And I stop where the street is because you know, I don't want a car to come on and hit me while I'm watching this thing. So I stop before I cross the street and I don't cross the street and it continues on. Across the street, there's an empty lot next to another apartment complex. And then down this way where I was headed was the convenience store. And it goes into the, and this is where it gets strange. It goes, continues in that path. When it's right above the empty lot, and let me, that this is a clear night, clear, cold night, no clouds, no fog. Uh, and there's also ambient light over there because there's lights on the other apartment complex. There's another street light on the other side of the street. So there's ambient light over there. So I'm st I can still see it. It disappears. It vanishes. It goes from visible to invisible in three seconds. A fake. Nothing does that in real life. That we know of. That we, yeah, that I knew of up until that point. This thing, it turned from visible to invisible. Now I'm scared. Because nothing does that. And I'm completely sober. I, hadn't, I didn't start drinking until like two years into college. And this is like my first year in college. And I'm, I'm, I'm sober. I'm awake. I'm aware. You know, and I knew enough about UFOs at that point to know that, you know, missing time and all that kind of stuff. Uh, looking for any, you know, I started being aware of anything physical that happened. You know, you look for witness, you, you're trying to determine, is it a close encounter of the first kind, second time, kind, third kind, or fourth kind? This was a first kind because uh, there were no witnesses, there was no physical uh, evidence left behind. There were no physical effects on me either um, uh, that I know, that, I, that I, I'm sure of. <laughs> Let me put it that way. Um, I don't know if I want to get that far into it, but what? Come on, come on, come on. Well, I have a few days later, a couple of, you know, how you get these little capillary, red capillary things that pop up on your skin. Um, sure. And they pop up, and they'll, they'll hang around for a long time, but they'll go away too. I got two a few days, a few days after this sighting, like not more than three or four days. Exactly one inch apart. The same size, one inch apart, red dots. They look like the little capillary things. Uh, completely centered on either side of my sternum, uh, my sternal notch. One inch apart, symmetrical. <laughs> that was 1975. They're still there. They've never gone away. I don't know uh, if it was <laughs> anything to do with that. There's no way to know it. I just, I throw that in. This, this, the rest of the story, though, is way more interesting than that. But I have to put that in because you have to be aware of whether or not they were physical effects. That's the only, that's the only thing. So, I, you know, I'm scared. I, I forget, I forget about going to get my sandwiches and I, I run back home to the apartment and I'm like pacing around. Oh my God. And I have nobody to talk to. Nobody's there. But me. I thought, Okay, I got my sketch pad here. I got a pencil. 
I better just sketch what I just saw. And that's what I did. Um, and then, when, of course, when my mom got home, I tried to explain it to her. You know, how moms are. Yeah, of course, I of course, I believe you. Yes, I, yes. I, I believe you're telling me what you actually saw, that kind of thing. My brothers were a little more cruel about it <laughs> when they got home. But that's the way brothers are, too. Um, and then uh, until a couple of years ago, I would tell anybody verbally that story. I would just never write it down. I never wrote it down anywhere except for that one sketch. And that's how I was able to not have to remember what it looked like, but, you know, I had the sketch contemporaneous right after I saw it. Okay, Fa fast forward on this decades later, the internet comes along, uh, which at first, I, at first I was in the 90s, I was even looking, is anybody putting maps up and stuff? I wanted to, I wanted to map all of this. I want to see, you know, an aerial view of what was happening here. Anyway, I had to wait till Google Maps, which was not until uh, much later. And then it occurred to me like the early 2000s, I said, I said to myself, oh, wow, I can, I can go to Google Maps and I can look at this. But, but before that, um, I'm, I'm reading, I don't read a lot about UFOs, but I, I found a paperback copy of the Philadelphia Experiment. And um, I'm reading along on the Philadelphia Experiment, which is about, I don't know if you know, know about the Philadelphia Experiment, but it's the a Navy. That teleported. There's, yeah, there's a, there's a Wikipedia page on it even, um, where they uh, were trying to uh, experiment with radar and visibility with a ship. Um, and... Um, but in reality, it was uh, physical invisibility with the ship. And they were basing all this off of a, a manuscript that was sent to the Navy or somebody, Navy secretary or somebody, by uh, an obscure scientist. Um, and the Navy was so fascinated with this. It was about UFO technology involving invisibility. And... So the Navy was so fascinated. They, and I'm reading along, and I'm reading the Navy. Uh, they want to distribute a few copies of this manuscript to to some higher high level people to read. So they contract that to one of their military contractors who does printing for them and other things. A little company, guess where? Garland, Texas, called Vero Manufacturing. They're a military contractor for the Navy. And other things. And I grew up knowing about Vero manufacturing because I'm I grew up I graduated from Garland High School, and all of my I had friends whose parents worked at Vero. My dad worked at Collins Radio, which I've written about, um, because that relates to the Kennedy assassination. But um, so I'm reading along in the Philadelphia Experiment. I see Garland, Texas, Vero Manufacturing printed their little manuscript that they distributed to their you know, a few people. And <laughs> so I, I look up on Google Maps. Okay, where was Vero Manufacturing back in 1975? Guess where it was? It was one mile, almost due south from where I saw the UFO. And where was the UFO headed? Due south. The UFO was heading towards Vero Manufacturing, who had printed a thing for the Navy uh, at the time of the Philadelphia experiment <laughs> about UFO technology and invisibility. And this thing seemed to be heading towards Vero manufacturing. Do you think that was what they were making or do you think it was UFO thing? Who knows? Those are just the facts. Everything else is speculation. Those are the facts. And it was decades later that I had that follow up to. All right. Now, Let's go to 1996. Before you get to your second story, I just want to preface this conversation with the fact that I've talked to some major UFO people on my show before. And I'm not talking about experiencers. I'm talking about Nick Pope from Ancient Aliens. I'm talking about skeptics like Mick West and Michael Shermer who try and debunk them. But I will give you this. Recently, about a month ago, you'll probably see the article trending. A guy named Jorg Arnu was on my show. 
The reason why he's been trending recently is because the FBI raided his house. A month after he was on my show, I started getting comments on my videos saying he just got raided. His whole site is called Dreamland Resort, and it's all about black sites. It's basically looking at Area 51 because he lives relatively close by to where Area 51 is. Oh, yeah, I know that he's about this. So he got raided. Uh, all they destroyed all of his equipment. If you listen to his episode, I asked him about aliens at Area 51, and he goes, "No, it's just U2 spy planes." And we went into the military tech and how advanced everything was for a good hour of that show. And then they raided him, and I go, "What did they blame you?" They go, "They thought I was a Russian spy." It is horrible, but that's like real things of like, yeah, the government probably has some high tech technology. Definitely, I mean, they can make projections. Um, off of air you don't need a projection screen anymore and i think about i mean i had uh dave betty Beatty, i think his last name is same time i had gary aguilar on around the same time i think they're one episode apart from each other he was the one with the u.s nimitz about seeing those tic tac like things so he did a whole documentary on that stuff so i mean i'm into the ufo stuff for sure it's definitely something i think is interesting how we're now starting to talk about it and to change the stigma of the word they just just call it aerial phenomena. Yeah. And like I like I said uh, in my article on the moon landing hoax, I said that um, those of us who've seen these things with our own eyes right in front of us, we don't have the luxury of skepticism. Uh, people who haven't seen them, they can still be skeptical. But when you've seen one in real life, not on not on film, not it, not in pictures, not on TV, in real life, right in front of you. When you've seen one like that, it's clear. Uh, you can't be skeptical. You could, you could like go into psychological denial. You could compartmentalize it. A lot of people have. A lot of experiences have. But um, if you are, if you confront it, you know, if you're uh, sane and mature, and you don't want to compartmentalize it or deny it. You have to, you know, accept that you did see this and that it was real. And so that's not skepticism anymore. You cannot, you can no longer say, I don't believe in UFOs. I don't think they're real. I think people are imagining it because you didn't imagine it. Yeah. Skepticism becomes a luxury at that point because you know you saw something real. It can't be explained by what you've been taught was aircraft technology. So um, that's how I came out as a UFO experience. I said, those of us, just a very subtle sentence. And those of us who've seen these things with our own eyes no longer have the um, luxury of skepticism. And that's true. So, you know, I, so that was, that sighting was weird enough, right? So I'm carrying that with me and trying to understand it. And in 1996, we go to a wedding in uh, San Diego. And we're flying back. We have a layover in El Paso. And, you know, I know that the route back is Southern California, kind of swinging around through the southwestern states to El Paso. And so we're halfway into the flight. It's about noon. Because um, I, I know that at noon we're going to be halfway there. So I know it's around noon. And I always take the window seat. Uh, my wife's on my right. And I always look out the window because having seen a UFO, I mean, you never know. So you always kind of try to be aware. And I also, I love looking at um, the ground from the air, from clouds and everything. On this particular day, there were no clouds. It was perfectly clear, crisp blue sky. This is in December. This is December 16, 1996. And so, and then all of a sudden, you know, I'm look, I'm checking out the ground. And also, I know that we're going to be flying over, you know, uh, Arizona, New Mexico, you know, which is legendary places for, you know, weird stuff. Edwards Air Force Base and all that. We're a little too far south for Area 51, but I didn't, I wasn't really aware of that at the time. And so I'm looking for anything strange on the ground that looks like an Area 51, weird landing strips or, or anything high tech Air Force. And I'm seeing like, I, you can see cars on the ground, 
I mean, we're at 30,000 30, cruising speed, I estimate, because we're right in the middle of flight, we're at cruising, cruising altitude and speed. And you can still see like, little tiny cars, you know, they look like ants and things. And this was out in, in rural areas, so you didn't see many of them. And so any motion would call your attention. I saw little airplanes, little private airplanes, way, way down below us. I saw the speed they were moving at relative to the speed of the cars and all that. Taking all this in, all of a sudden, there's something glints the sun. It's forward of me. Here's the window. Here's me. And I'm looking out. The, you know, it's a little window, so you have to really kind of look. And then something forward of the aircraft glints in the sun, and I look. Oh, my God. Three silver chrome orbs. It's like three ball bearings <laughs> flying together. And they weren't just like cruising along together. And you can find videos of this now. In, in fact, one of one of the Pentagon's press conferences a few months ago, they showed a video that a pilot had taken of a UFO going by his plane, and they freeze framed it, and it's a chrome silver orb. So now part of the UAP investigation is a chrome silver orb in the air passing by an aircraft. So I've been vindicated there. This was three, though. And there are videos of three. There's a famous one of in the sky. People with a huge crowd in New York saw them up there. And they're kind of like floating around, you know, like this. These three were going at high speed in the opposite direction of the plane. Um, you'll see in my written version how I calculated how far they were. I estimated two wingspans distant, which is pretty close when you're, you know, that high in, in an airplane dangerously close so i knew the pilots were seeing this right and i said to my wife if you want to see a ufo just look out the window there's a ufo out there she goes no that's the way my wife is no well at least get the, the flight attendant i know the pilots are seeing this so i want to report them. no don't say anything she's like kicking me and all this fine <laughs> so once again, I don't want to look away for very long because I want to see what, what's happening. So I'm looking at it and I'm being shut down. On, I did look away further long enough to see if anybody else in the plane was looking out the window. I looked behind me. Um, we were, uh, I'm usually right in front of the wing or behind the wing. I think I was just in front of the wing at, at this point. So I'm looking back and there's a whole part of the airplane behind me. Everybody's like either reading or sleeping. Nobody looks out the window. Most people, in my experience in flying. Um, so that's where it was. And I, so immediately back to the window. And I'm watching it. Like it's going past. It's a, I estimate the same speed we're moving forward. It's moving the other direction. And so I'm only seeing it for like a minute, minute and a half, maybe. Um, and the three ball bearings, chrome, silver, are like bobbing around each other like this as they move in unison in that direction. I've described it this way in person. If you saw three, three birds, you see this in migrating birds sometimes, you'll see three together. And the way they're like bobbing around each other as they fly, that's the motions these three chrome spheres were making. And, um, so um, I watch them until they're too distant to see anymore. And I didn't take up, I had my camera and my camera bag under the seat in front of me, but we had just come from a wedding and I had used up all my film. I had my camera, I didn't have any film. Um, which is not a big deal to me because uh, I'm an artist, first of all. I've had photography training. Um, I know how to do superimpositions on photography. I did dark room. I was trained in dark room in college. And so even if you take a picture, you know, it's got to be authenticated. And people can immediately accuse you. If you know anything about photography, they can, especially back then, they can accuse you of having faked it. So it wasn't a big deal. So I didn't have any evidence, no witnesses. Once again, no witnesses. My wife wouldn't even look at it. Uh, I wasn't allowed to talk to the attendants or the, or the pilots. So I just had this other story. Now, then decades later, you know what? 
once again, I'm not studying UFOs. I'm interested in them, of course, because I've seen them. But I'm not like studying them because by this time, by 96, I'm like several years now into my JFK research. So I don't go there. And then I, th this is the follow-up to that story. Um, I didn't, wasn't even aware of it at the time. I was aware of the Phoenix lights. Oh, I did. I did Google, Google map. And I noticed that if, you know, San Diego to El Paso, halfway point is just south of Phoenix. Somewhere south of Phoenix. Then it occurred to me, okay, when, when was the Phoenix lights? I looked it up. This was six months. No, this was three months before the Phoenix lights, just south of Phoenix. So that's the follow-up to that story. Those are the facts. Everything else is speculation. But there have been a documented videos now of these silver orbs, which people had talked about for a long time. That's a more typical. Um, it's rare that I'll find a description of one that fits my first one. But I did. I have found them in the National UFO Reporting Center files and MUFON. Um, I would probably believe more that it would be government tech. Um, I've always st I've always stand in that boat. But I also bring up the thing is when we sent the golden record into space in case it came across any aliens, we just assume it's going to be one species of aliens. Imagine if it's just a bunch of them and they're coming down here like we do when it comes to Mexico. Like everybody goes on vacation to Mexico, basically, or does something like that. I just picture that type of scenario. We have different types of aliens if there is aliens that are visiting us. You know what I mean? That's why you have so many different descriptions. You got John Lennon talking about seeing on his balcony with Yoko uh, a giant saucer-like thing, and then you have. Hey, guess when that one was? I only I only looked that up recently. Uh, that was like uh, four or five months before my first sighting. That was just a few months before my first sighting. The John I had Lennon. A, I've had a couple of people talk about that on the show before about their alien research and what they've i believe more of the triangle thing i've seen something before and i wouldn't even call it an alien encounter but just like i used to, when i was like 14 15 years old i used to live next to a golf course so we'd always at night go on the golf course and try and see if we find golf balls just stupid stuff i mean i had a whole golf ball drawer uh by my bed basically and it was just like oh, look at them i don't know why i thought it was cool to collect golf balls but whatever um but I remember looking up at the sky and you usually see the stars a little bit. You see a couple here and there. And there was three really sh bright shining ones, like in a triangle formation. And I remember telling my friend, I was like, looked up at the thing. I was like, it's like, are those the three stars that the wise men saw and did that? Because that's what I was thinking. And he was just like, I don't think so. It might be a planet or an airplane. And we stared at it for a minute. It wasn't blinking. And then I just started like walking forward as I'm still staring at it. And I noticed that it was like, if you're staring at my hand right here, it just started going like, so you're seeing an edge. And I'm like, is it the sky messed up? Like, what is going on? And then we really just kind of moved on after that and went back into my house. Um, yeah. But it, what else yeah. can you do? So it's like 2D space type stuff. And I've seen people talk about that before. I've had an interest and I've talked about it a bit on my show. But that's really, I mean, it's, it's, I mean, do you feel comfortable talking about it now because it's all validated because the government has now been openly doing meetings about it? I'm hoping that they're doing more behind closed doors. Like they're not just everything that we're seeing, they're doing something deeper research. You know, they are, you know, they are. Well, I saw one of their committee hearings that they played and they were asking questions like, did the government look into this incident? The government looking at this incident and the UAP task force was like, Oh no, we were not made aware of that incident. And the guy's like, "What?" And I was just like, "This is where I'm like, I'm hoping that they're just playing dumb on purpose, and they're actually definitely more focused into it." In my article on the moon landing hoax, I uh, cited Richard Dolan. Uh, I referred people to Richard Dolan, who's done actual uh, work. He, he wrote a little book on the secret space program, based on the speech he gave about it. Um. Have, you know, you know who Richard Dolan is. He's interviewed on all the documentaries and stuff, and he's got his own uh, YouTube channel and stuff. He does uh, podcasts and stuff. Um, and uh, I like I like Richard Dolan uh, as a serious historian. He's taught it in college. Um, he started out as um, a journalist and historian, and he just 
decided to do multi-volume scholarly work on um, the government and UFOs. And he, I think he's he's like the um, Doug Horn of the UFO world. He, he's huge. He's working on like the third volume now of, uh, of the government and UFOs. Huge, uh, huge work, multi-volume. Like. That will probably be released more before the Kennedy assassination will be. Doug Horn did like what six volumes on the ARB. Yeah, I asked Tom about that. I was like, was Doug Horn the only dissenter amongst you guys out of all the ARRB crew? Tom seems more like of a dissenter. He doesn't go really into the deep conspiratorial stuff, but he told me some interesting stuff like when he went to go get – um, apparently after Clay Shaw's trial – um. And whatever happened, the verdict was reached. It was Garrison was the one that took the documents of Clay Shaw. And he, Tom was the one that was in charge of going to Clay Shaw's friend's house and grabbing those documents to go put in the archives. And there was a bunch of interesting stuff he said about Richard Case and Gell, who people I really have. I don't think you need to get to get the public interested. I don't think you need to talk about those figures. But even you don't even really need to talk about Garrison. You just kind of point at the facts of the case and then show how like whatever things have been manipulated but the doug horn was the only dissenter question i mean everyone has he said that everyone has their own personal opinions but you know doug horn being the only dissenter i think there's a lot of people that necessarily didn't believe the official conclusion of it which just makes it more interesting because i mean it is one of the biggest cover-ups in all time well we're only you know we i call myself a dissenter of course but we're only dissenters because the government's lying we're telling the truth. Uh, we're not really dissenting anything. We're the ones telling the truth. It's the government that's dissenting from the truth. That was one of the most dangerous things about Tucker Carlson saying something about the JFK stuff, even if it's the Julian West stuff, because then he recently said something else about the JFK thing. But he talked he tackled Daniel Sheehan's theory about the Watergate burglars um, and Nixon's plot to kill Kennedy. Um, so I don't believe that. I mean, it's very very well i've heard people go over it a couple of times i think i would probably point more of the more of the blame to alan dulles and j edgar hoover uh which is interesting to me is that i know i know you're not a big reader uh and you haven't read my Damn. especially my long detailed stuff but those who read my thing on the rambler which is not entirely about the rambler it's just like where the rambler took me into the whole conspiracy um, I go into the evidence that Nixon was a conspirator, and I discovered it in Peter Dale Scott's manuscript before he ever wrote a book on the Kennedy assassination. He wrote a manuscript that everybody photocopied and sent around, and I had a pretty good readable copy of it. And a lot of what I write about in that article, the possible discovery of an automobile used in the JFK conspiracy, a lot of it is footnoted to that unpublished manuscript called... Um, uh, the Dallas uh, conspiracy, and he goes into detail. Uh, he he did publish a little book about Dallas and Watergate later that goes into that. Uh, but you look at Nixon's involvement. That even in the Warren Commission, they have the whole little story and the newspaper clippings of, about Nixon. They tried to make a case that Oswald was stalking Nixon earlier in the year. Uh, well, Marina allegedly locked Oswald in the bathroom, saying yeah, he was going to try and kill Nixon. Locked him in a bathroom where uh, uh, it, it locks only from the inside, not the outside. <laughs> there's no way she could have locked him in the bathroom. So that part was made up too. Uh, well, there's a lot of yeah, stuff, that and that's was part made of up. the Nixon. That's part of the Nixon made up Nixon story that they wanted. They couldn't hide the fact that Nixon was in Dallas that day. And if you want to see that depicted. Uh, it's in Oliver Stone's Nixon did a movie, which is pretty much the sequel to JFK. Well, I mean, even if you look at the Warren Commission, the Warren Commission used um, his dishonorable dis or not dishonorable discharge, his injury in the line of duty Oswald's with the bullet wound. They called it a discharge, but they they made it seem like it was a dishonorable discharge, which is different than just a medical discharge um, or honorary leave. And they used that discharge to later uh, try to make a case there, there was a whole there's a whole element still i guess that tries to make a case that 
um, that Oswald was out to get Connolly, that the Connolly wounding was Oswald also, and that he he was really trying to shoot Connolly and he got JFK as uh, collateral damage because he was trying to shoot Connolly because uh, he was Navy secretary under Kennedy when Oswald got his discharge and, and so he was uh, you know, mad at Connolly <laughs> about because he, he tried. There, they, it goes in that he was in Austin in September, you know, around the time of the Odeo incident in Dallas. And he, he tried to get in to see Colin. There's a whole thing about that. Who knows what to make of any of that? Is They're just trying to further incriminate Oswald. Well, so how many things have to get busted before, you know, eventually people stop or start questioning their government a little bit more? Well, that's I mean, the thing. That goes back to what, what I was saying before, that, um, you know, we're stuck in this, I guess it's a comfort zone, but the government, this... You're only comfortable because you're sitting in that big ass chair. Oh, let me tell you about this chair. Here's Jeez. another. <laughs> I've been in this chair from day one, and I chose this setting for your podcast because this is this was Erwin Schwartz's favorite chair. This was the chair at at my wife's family, at my in laws' house that I would go to every Thanksgiving, and Erwin would sit in this chair. We'd be watching football. And, you know, I would, Ir Erwin Schwartz was Abraham Zapruder's business partner. I've written about that. Um, I One of the things I put up that's never been published before, we didn't have room for it in my book, but I put up the interview that Noel Twyman and I had with Erwin. We, we were at uh, 1994 uh, ASK conference in Dallas. Noel Twyman was there. He was working on his book. Bloody Treason, which came out later, I highly recommended. He uh, he hooked up with me, and uh, he word had gotten around by this book because I'd written about it in my my unpublished manuscript that was circulating um, about Erwin Schwartz being my wife's uncle. And so Noel Twyman said, uh, you know, Tommy's writing writing his book. He's going to get into the Spurrier film. Wondered if if Erwin would submit to a recorded interview. I said, I don't know. Why don't we call him? I had his number. So we go to a payphone, we call him up. He says, yeah, um, buy me lunch at my favorite restaurant and bring a tape recorder, we'll do it. So Noel Twyman and I met him at Vincent's uh, Seafood Restaurant up on Northwest Highway. And we said, he knew the, he knew the owners, of course. <laughs> and so they gave us a nice big round table with a big booth around it. And I set up the recorder, and old Twyman got his notes out, and Erwin's sit, sitting opposite of us. And, and we start an interview, um, you know, an hour and a half interview, and we record the whole thing. And I took detailed notes of the tape um, where I, I, I did this not for Noel. Noel had a copy of the tape, and he refers to the, to the tape in his book. And that was the first published uh, version of that interview, Bloody Treason by Noel Twyman. Um, but I was dealing with Harry Livingstone at the time, who was writing Killing Kennedy, and he wanted to talk about uh, the Pruder film and Irwin, Irwin's story. And it was the uh, just a year before, Irwin had gotten a lot of media attention. He was interviewed by BBC and by NBC. Um, about his story. So he was, had been discovered, you know, Abe's, Abe's business partner. And, but he, see, he was with Zapruder the whole time they were processing the film. He know, he witnessed everything that involves the early chain of custody of the Zapruder film. And that's, that was the value of his knowledge. The thing is, BBC, they did an excellent little thing. And I linked in that Substack article, that's one of the videos I linked to, the whole video of the BBC that included him uh, is on YouTube now, the whole thing. And I'll give you a link to it. You can you can see him interviewed. But they didn't ask the right questions. Noel and I, that's why Noel and I wanted to talk to him. This was a great opportunity for me because I've been talking to him at holidays for years now. And it, it, he was sitting in this chair. This was Erwin's chair when he was telling me his whole story at our in-laws every Thanksgiving. That's why I chose this chair to talk to you from.
anyway, um, so for Harry, uh, I didn't want to send him a copy of the tape because Noel, Noel was still working with it and uh, I didn't want it getting out. And I, you know, Erwin was still being, you know, somewhat a private citizen still, even though he'd been on major media. And I felt like I would need his permission before I like started releasing it and somebody like put it out. So I, I didn't give it to Harry Livingstone, but I wrote a detailed narrative. And that's what's on Substack. It's everything Irwin said, but written out where you can read it as a narrative. It's not like question, answer, question, answer, which can be awkward, you know, the way. The way we're talking now, if you've ever read one of your transcripts of these podcasts, you see why I rewrote it into a, a readable narrative. And it, it's it's long. It takes about, you know, most of the stuff I've put up there has been like no more than five, 10 minute read. They log this as a 23 minute read. So it's a long interview and it's everything he said in the order he said it. Easy to read with links to stuff like his BBC interview. and. So we we did that in 1994, and I forget what point I was making with that. But oh, the chair, yeah, the chair. So you didn't give me any of the questions. What did he say? What did he reveal? He, uh, here's what he revealed, uh, and I I I kind of update it and expand it with author's notes. But he revealed that there was a shell game. There was a shell game. He said things like, there's no way, you know, they they wrote out a handwritten release for Jameson Film Company, the ones who who did the copies. They had three copies made that day. Kodak, they went to Kodak to get it developed. Secret Service, uh, Forrest Soros drove them to Kodak. Get it developed. They saw the film there. I learned new things about, about this chain of possession from him that day. Um. <laughs> So they, they develop the film, they put it in the projector, they run it. It's not split yet. So, but they have a little projector that can like blank out the other side. You know, there's two two sides to it. You can film on one side, then you flip the cassette over and you film the other side. But when you show it without it being split, you see one film running in forward and one film running backwards, unless you hide that side. Kodak had a special projector where they could hide the side that was running backwards. And it was just Zapruder's grandkids anyway that he'd shot earlier. Um, they ran the film. Erwin said it was clear as a bell, clear as he's ever seen it. Of course, it's the original film. Um, and then the guy who developed it for him was the manager there. He asked permission to show it to the staff that was on duty there that night. And about 30 other people come in and watch the film a couple of times. You learn about other witnesses to the early, to the original Zapruder film. That happened also the next morning. Irwin, I found out Irwin was the guy running the projector. And Zapruder didn't, he didn't run the projector. Irwin ran the projector. You'll find references in other people's writing that it was a rickety projector. Irwin said it wasn't a rickety projector. It was a good projector. It was just on like a flimsy table. So it was a little shaky table. Um, but Erwin, and he estimates we, we ran it about 15 times that Saturday. And so, you know, and all the, the people who came for the press, um, the guy from Life who eventually bought it, uh, they're all there and they're all watching it. Not Dan Rather, not on Saturday. Dan Rather didn't see it till Monday. We found that out from Erwin. There are some major discrepancies in Erwin's story to this day that are not being talked about, major discrepancies, like the fact that Irwin says he didn't take the film, he didn't deliver the film to life until like the next Tuesday, till after Tuesday or Wednesday, after the funeral, after Kennedy's funeral, he has a specific memory of not delivering life's copies to Stoley, Richard Stoley, until after the Kennedy funeral. Which completely blows away Stoley's story that he he got the copies right after they signed the contract on Saturday. He got Irwin says 
yeah, that could have maybe happened, but I I was there and I didn't see that happen. But I can't deny that it couldn't have happened. That's the way he did all. Anytime we got him on a discrepancy, that's the way he would put it. He said, I didn't see everything. I couldn't see everything. But this is what I did. This is what I remember that I did. You know, he was given the test to meet Stoli at the Adolphus Hotel and give him the copies that he had contracted. What the heck is that about? What happened there? I believe Erwin when he says that because he's called totally believable on that. What was that? You know, if Stoli left on Saturday with the three co- with the copies or with the co- whatever whatever they contracted to that he took with him, so so Irwin's later said in the interview, I, I don't believe Stoli. He, he complimented Stoli up and down. He loved R- Richard Stoli. He was a complete gentleman. He said that they they loved Life magazine. They wanted them to have a film. Blah blah, blah all that. He liked Richard Stoli, but he said. I don't believe Richard Stoley when he says that he had this, that life had the film that Saturday night. Erwin never believed that. Um, and he, he, he always called Dan Rather a liar too from, from early. He always considered Dan Rather a liar way before anybody else thought to consider Dan Rather a liar about this superior film. Him and Cronkite. He wasn't there. Uh, no, Dan Rather. On Monday, Dan Rather uh, goes to Zapruder's lawyer's office uh, to see the film for for CBS um, KL, KLRD uh, KRLD in Dallas CBS affiliate and he goes and, and watches the film in Sam Passman's office the, the lawyer for Abe Zapruder and that's when he rushes from the lawyer's office goes on air and describes what he just saw in the film. That's when that happened. A lot of people get confused about when that happened, but it happened on Monday. Um, Monday afternoon, he goes on air and describes the film. And of course, he says things like, uh, uh, Kennedy is thrust violently forward and, and this kind of thing. But in my little article on Frame 227, and all of this plays into it because a lot's happening at Frame 227 that was cut out because Frame 227 replaces an edit in the Zapruder film. It's a composite film that was created to take out all the other movements that have been described by witnesses, by Zapruder himself, by Dan Rather, by Connolly. They all describe the same movements that should be happening at Frame 227, but are gone. And that includes Connolly being shot. It also includes Kennedy uh, seemingly, Zapruder thought he was playing a joke when he was watching this through a telephoto lens. He sees Kennedy go, oh, like, oh, they got me. You don't see that in the film today. Um, But back to Dan Rather, maybe Dan Rather was telling the truth. Everybody considered it. He's lying. He knew he was lying. He was being deep state. He was lying about Kennedy being violently going forward. Remember, Rather saw the original. He saw the original film, or the one of the first copies of it. That weekend, there are bootleg copies. There's the story of uh, um, Rothermel, who was the assistant to H.L. Hunt. Rothermel wrote a book where he tells the story that he got a copy of the Zapruder film that weekend. The only way you can get a copy of the Zapruder film that weekend the only place copies were made was at the Jameson Film Company. And Irwin would say, yeah, we signed the release that you're only to, to make these number of copies. And Jameson protested that the manager at Jameson that night on duty, he uh, he protested signing a release, but eventually gave in and signed the release. But once they, Irwin said, once they got in the back room, even if they could see them through the glass, they didn't know what they were doing. They didn't know how film was handled and processing like that. They could have made other copies without us even knowing it. But we had the contract, you know, but we couldn't we couldn't verify that it wasn't happening. But that's the only place where copies could have been made. And I'm convinced that bootleg copies, because we've heard six other researchers, or half a dozen other researchers over the years, describe seeing a different copy of the Zapruder film. So if it's 
it's got to be, I call them Jameson bootlegs. That's the only place those first, first day copies could have come from. And that's the kind of stuff we learned in that interview. And you can now read the whole thing at uh, bartholomews.substack.com. I'm gonna have no to paywall. It's, it's all free. I wanted to get it out from behind paywalls. And so I'm putting up interesting things like that that I've distributed. If someone was to email me and say, I heard about your interview with Erwin. Can you send me that? I will send them that. I transcribed George Michael Evica's workshop from 1993 about Conley. That's way too, I'd have to, I've long since in several computer crashes lost the um, digital text of that, but I have it scanned, but not, somebody could o OCR it. I guess OCR is good enough now that you could do it and get, you know, digital text again. I haven't done it. And it's way too long to retype. So uh, it exists in that, uh, just a scan PDF. Um, things like that. And, I, and, and anybody that wants a copy, I can send them a copy. It's on, it's on Dropbox. It's in my Dropbox. Well, why don't you say off your links where people can find your stuff? Um, so now I've purposely put this up. Bartholomew's. It's my name, but take off the M-E-W at the end, put in V-I-E-W-S, Bartholomew's. It's my cartooning brand name. I started using that when I started doing editorial cartooning. Um, and I use it for all my social media. I'm Bartholomew's at whatever. YouTube, um, Twitter, even Instagram, which, which I don't do much with. But Bartholomew's at is where it is. So, at Substack, it's bartholomews.substack.com. That's the new place, and that's where I'm putting up uh, interesting stuff that's never been published before that we couldn't get in my book. Plus, I'm, I'm putting up excerpts, some of my favorite stuff from my book. And I'm going to continue excerpts. I'm not going to put the long stuff up there because it's too long. It's book length by itself, like the Rambler article and the, the, uh, the gun article. But I am going to do um, excerpts from those because they're really long and there's sections of it that are full length articles just on their own. Like I want to, I want to take out the whole section I did on the danger. I may call it this, the danger of using motive as evidence of a conspiracy. I did a whole long rant about that. And Walter Graf's in my article about the, the gun and the Mauser and the clip. Um, but yeah, first half of the gun article is about the clip and the and the planting of ballistic evidence. The whole second part of that art that article is me analyzing what all of this means. We have evidence that Oswald was framed by planting the rifle and planting this clip. What does all this mean? And so I did a lot of editorializing in the second half of that article. And that's when I went into things like the problem of using motive as evidence of conspiracy, which seems to be the fad for years now. Uh, and that's what gets people in trouble with, uh, you know, the Jews did it. Mm -hmm. Bill Nelson, Bill Nelson just put up an article where, you know, he got into trouble already saying, because he found, he found a document that LBJ went to visit a site in New Mexico um uh, in uh 66 67 something like that where they're setting up a sound stage and a movie studio <laughs> that looks like the lunar surface <laughs> and so he was already buying into the the gaslighting myth we're not that, doing that we're not doing that no 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 but but nelson phil nelson this is what he had he had to write a follow-up apology for doing that yeah, yeah, it's good evidence. It's a good document that LBJ went and visited a site like that. And yeah, as early as 66, 67, uh, I could see Richard Holmes, you know, and saying something like, you know, we might not get to the moon by the end of the decade and the Russians might try to beat us. We, we might want to try to fake this. Now, I'm, I'm not saying they didn't try to fake it. I'm saying it wouldn't have worked anyway. Uh, they could have started it and abandoned it. 
you know, in my analysis, it's it's easier. And other people have said this too. Huh. You look at what it would have taken to fake that to that high quality that people try to claim. It's easier just to go to the moon. <laughs> it's easier and less expensive to go to the moon than it is to fake it in a movie studio. We're not talking about the moon landing. We already talked about UFOs and we somehow put JFK in the mix. But there, there and there is an overlap with the Kennedy assassination. My only uh, entry into that was showing was my article, and I'm going to put it up soon. I'll put it on Substack about how the moon landing hoax is itself a hoax. Well, I'm going to link all your links in the description so people will be able to find it. Bartholomews.substack.com, and then just Google Bartholomews app, whatever. Find me on social media elsewhere. I link to Substack now because that's where I'm putting all the, the interesting stuff. There you go. Boom. And I'm going to link in all the descriptions. It's been a pleasure, Chad. Thanks for listening to this episode. Out of the book.